Senator McAllister, it being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, uh, Senator Ruxton. I refer to the fact that five out of the seven closing the gap targets have not been met or are not on track. Uh, will one of the 40 new targets uh, set in April be a justice target? The Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Ruston. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Dodson, for your question. Um, all the more pertinent because it is today. Um, in relation to the new targets that will be set following the consultation with the peaks and through the COAG process, uh, obviously uh, will be something that I'm more than happy to take on notice in and uh, ask the Minister for Indigenous Australians to respond to the specifics of the last part of your question. Um, however, um, if I could say more broadly in relation to closing the gap. I think um, everybody in this place, on this side, on that side, on the crossbenches and in the other place, except the fact that today uh, the update on the closing the gap targets was not what we would have liked to have seen. Um, however, I can assure this place and I can assure all Australians, uh, Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians, that this government is absolutely committed to working with Indigenous Australians on closing the gap to make sure that every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in this country grows up with the same opportunities as every other Australian. We also um, understand that the progress that we've made over the previous decade um, has not been successful. And I think today everybody has acknowledged the reason that it hasn't been successful is because it has been a top-down approach by governments of different persuasions and in different places, both here in Canberra and around Australia. But today probably heralds one of the most important changes, and that is a change in the approach to how we are intending to approach addressing uh, the closing the gap targets and initiatives. And that is by greater consultation with Indigenous Australians and starting to build the way that we approach this by being informed and consulted uh, and being designed by Indigenous Australians. So whilst today has not been the day that we would have liked to have seen, where we had seen significant improvement in the, gap, in the closing the gap uh, indicators, I think we can celebrate the fact that we have acknowledged we haven't done well in the past and we must do better in the future. Senator Dodson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, two years ago, the First Nations peoples uh, delivered the Uluru Statement from the heart and offered a clear uh, pathway forward. Will the Morrison government hold a referendum in this term, of, in this term to enshrine a First Nations voice to Parliament in the Constitution? What a great Senator question. Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Dodson, for your question. The one thing that the, uh, the, the government has absolutely given a categorical um, commitment on is to work with First Australians to make sure that whatever is designed and whatever is developed, um, as we move forward in, in recognition um, of uh, ongoing recognition in, of Indigenous Australians, is that it will be informed by a co-design process where Indigenous Australians and Indigenous communities are absolutely at the forefront of that design process. In fact, I just met with the head of the Peaks um, to talk to them about specific initiatives that sit within my portfolio area so that we can make sure that what we're doing is being far better informed about what Indigenous Australians want, uh, because the only way that we're going to get a successful outcome in closing the gaps going forward is being making sure that the design of the methods by which we go about closing that gap are being designed by our Indigenous Australians. Senator Dodson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, if the government has ruled out enshrining a voice to parliament in the constitution, what form of constitutional change is the government proposing? Senator Rustin. Look, thank you very much, um, Senator Dodson. Um, what I'd like to really reiterate is the fact that th this is an iterative process. It's a process of co-design, and the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken White, has made it very, very clear that he intends to continue to work in a collaborative way with all Australians, but particularly with Indigenous Australians, about our pathway forward on constitutional recognition and how the voices of Indigenous Australians are going to be heard into the future. But today, as we celebrate um, the, the new way forward, um, and we, we acknowledge the bad, the, we acknowledge the bad outcomes of the past. 
to the, today we are talking about moving forward in a new way with Indigenous Australians to make sure that the process of closing the gap is informed by Indigenous Australians. We can't shy away from the fact that the results today have not been what we accepted or what we would have wanted. I, I am not shying away from that. The Prime Minister doesn't shy away from that. The Minister for Indigenous Australians does not shy away from the fact that the results to today Rustin, were not good. Time for the answers expired. Senator Brockman. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Peru-Australia Free Trade Agreement and how it will benefit Australian exporters, manufacturers, farmers and businesses? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Brockman uh, for his, uh, his question, his advocacy, particularly for regional Australians and uh, Australian farming businesses in terms of access under uh, our free trade network of agreements. Indeed, overnight, the Peru-Australia free trade agreement entered into force. Uh, this is a very strongly negotiated positive agreement for Australia, with over 99 per cent of all tariffs on Australian goods to Peru ultimately being eliminated expanding on the outcomes that were negotiated as part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, Peru has been one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America and at times the world over the last decade. And while Peru is relatively unknown to many Australian exporters in terms of the details, it has a gross domestic product comparable to that of Vietnam. It has high rates of GDP growth and a population in excess of 31 million people. Peru provides a similar consumer base to that of Malaysia, a long-standing trade partner of Australia's. This FTA places Australia in a strong position to be able to share in Peru's continued economic growth, providing opportunities that will expand our engagement into the future. PAFTA provides new opportunities to Australian farmers, with zero tariffs on beef within five years under PAFTA, giving the same access into Peru as US farmers already have. PAFTA provides our sugar farmers better access to sell sugar than Peru has provided to any other sugar exporting country in the last 20 years. Australian dairy farmers have access, historic new access to Peru uh, with zero tariffs from day one under PAFTA for 7,000 tonnes initially increasing to 10,000 tonnes uh, of product. Immediate duty free access for Australian wine, sheep meat, most horticulture products, kangaroo meat and wheat under PAFTA. Manufacturers benefit, as do our services and education sector, all with improved access outcomes thanks to the entry into force of PAFTA overnight. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Minister, for that answer. Minister, how has industry reacted to the Peru Australia Free Trade Agreement? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, yes, indeed, very excited. Thanks, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, uh, the uh, Queensland, uh, Queensland sugar industry, uh, Senator Watt, uh, has, uh, has said they expect to Australia to be able to fill uh, 30,000 tonnes of duty free sugar access to Peru. That's the initial uh, quota that is provided for, which grows over time. Uh, cane Growers uh, Australia have said they expect the deal will deliver an extra $13.5 million to cane farmers alone. Uh, the Red Meat Advisory Council has described PAFTA as an exciting new opportunity in the Latin American meat market. and They have noted that the forecast is for Peruvian beef consumption to triple uh, by 2020 and sheep meat consumption to increase by 20 per cent by 2025. Uh, and of course, the new market access there provides opportunities for Australian producers to seize large parts of that forecast growth. Energy markets, the Latin American Business Council and others have all welcomed the opportunities this provides for deeper business integration and growth Order. in exports. Senator Birmingham, Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government is supporting Australian exporters and creating more opportunities for them, and how does improved trade help build a stronger economy and create more Australian jobs? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. So we are able to deliver these trade agreements thanks to continued effort, negotiation and outcomes by our government, but I note also from bipartisan support in terms of the passage of these agreements through the chamber. And that's critically important, Mr. President, that we maintain that and recognise the growth and the dividend it's delivering to Australia. More Australian businesses are exporting today as a result of the trade agreements we have negotiated. For more than 53,000 small and medium enterprises exporting today, which has grown some 18.5 per cent in terms of the number of businesses exporting in our time in government. More Australians are employed in trade-related businesses. Uh, trade and exports are generating more jobs for Australians. Some 240,000 
trade-related jobs have been created, it's estimated, over the last five years. Australian household incomes are estimated to be higher, an average of $8,500 higher as a result of trade access around the world. More jobs, more businesses, higher incomes, thanks to our export markets. Order. Senator Walsh. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday in Senate question time, the minister said, and I quote, the government is not funding a new coal-fired power station. Former Resources Minister Senator Canavan has been reported as interjecting, and I quote, not yet. Will the minister rule out appeasing the latest tantrum from nationals like Senator Canavan by providing taxpayers' money for new coal-fired power generation? Order. 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 I'm not going to ask for any withdrawal about any language. I'm just going to urge senators to be careful about reflecting on the behaviour of other senators with, with, with terms. I, I, I thought I heard. Um, yes, yeah, Senator Wong. Just, just to clarify, the, the tantrum quote was from an unnamed Liberal Party source that was in a question yesterday. Oh, that's not a point of order. I'm just, I, I'm just urging senators to not get into the zone about that potentially calls upon me to ask for withdrawals upon reflection. Senator, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I think I've seen one or two tantrums in this uh, in this chamber. Usually, looking straight opposite here. Stop smiling, Senator Wong. <laughs> you really uh, you really shouldn't let yourself be caught out like that. But uh, certainly not from any colleagues uh, in uh, distinguished colleagues in the National Party, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President. Mr. President. Order. I would reiterate, firstly, in relation to the senator's question. I would, I would reiterate in relation to the senator's question that which I said yesterday. What the government is doing Order. is precisely what the government took to the last election. Order. We promised $10 million of funding for feasibility study. The feasibility studies are looking at two different projects in relation to the Queensland energy markets. That's what we're funding. That's what we're doing. Nothing more, nothing less. There are no further policy decisions that have been taken to take that any further at this stage. Those matters, of course, all depend upon seeing whether or not cases stack up. And if cases stack up, well then, in large part, it will be a matter to see what private sector reaction there is to funding cases that stack up in relation to energy markets. In terms of energy markets in Australia, and with a question about uh, the former Minister for Resources, who I know has played a big role in terms of energy policy as well, you know, I note that not only is Australia a country where at present our emissions are going down, but also importantly, where prices are going down, and, uh, and a critical part, a critical part for Australia in terms of this government's policy focus, is to make sure we have lower emissions, higher reliability, but lower prices for Australians as well. And wholesale energy prices have dropped in recent times, in some cases, by up to 35% in terms of reductions in wholesale energy prices. The wholesale energy prices for the national electricity market for the last quarter of last year were at the lowest level in years, Mr. President. That's what it's about: getting lower prices while making sure Order, we have Senator the reliability Birmingham. and emissions Time reductions we expired. promise. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Proponents of the Collinsville coal-fired power station are seeking a taxpayer-funded indemnity. Will the minister rule out providing a taxpayer-funded indemnity? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, as I just said in the answer to the first question, and again what I said yesterday Order. as well, the government's very clear about what it is we are doing. And they are feasibility studies, Mr President. Feasibility studies, business cases that will look into these projects. And, and of course, for business cases and feasibility studies, if they stack up, then you would expect to see investment that will flow in relation to projects that stack up. That is uh, how the commercial market works. We identified in the last election that, in relation to those regions of Queensland, there are questions about the reliability of energy. There are pressures in terms of the affordability of energy. These are issues, it seems, that the Queensland State Labor government has happily overlooked over a period of time. Order. Senator which, who you, Senator Watt, Rose on relevance, Senator Watt, on on relevance. the question was clearly about a taxpayer-funded indemnity, and we haven't heard anything about that point from the minister. Uh, uh, 
on the on the on the on the point of order, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer in a question, nor to use a particular word. I believe the minister is being directly relevant if he is talking about funding arrangements for this. He doesn't have to use a word that is used in the question. It is not appropriate, however, to talk about state government policies in this space and be directly relevant. Senator Wong. Well, uh, on the point of order, uh, I'm not clear what you've ruled, Mr President, but I would just draw to your attention uh, the uh, only aspect of funding that was asked about was a taxpayer-funded indemnity. No, I, I appreciate that, Senator Wong, and I, I've ruled that discussion of uh, matters of state government policy in this regard that aren't related to directly related to funding of this particular issue that's been in, uh, raised in the question are not directly relevant. I have been listening carefully to the minister's answer, and I do believe he was being directly relevant, talking about funding arrangements for this particular project. I can't instruct him how to answer a question or to use a particular word in the answer. But it was a specific question, so the answer must relate to funding. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I know those opposite who seem to want us to preempt the outcome of feasibility studies or business cases. And of course, their, their mates in the Queensland state government didn't even support such work being happening. Uh, we are standing on what we took to the Order, election, Senator delivering time data for the at this point in has time. Expired. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, the minister ruled out government funding for a new coal-fired power station. Why did the Prime Minister yesterday fail to rule out providing an indemnity which the Australian Industry Group says could cost taxpayers $17 billion? Senator Birmingham. No, Mr. Mr President, uh, I, I won't accept the words that the Senator tries to put into, uh, into my mouth about what I said yesterday. What I said yesterday is on the Hansard record. Order. What I said yesterday Order. is on the Hansard record and it should all be read entirely in context. What I said yesterday very clearly was the government is funding feasibility study business cases into two projects, $10 million, as we promised at the election. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, are we currently funding a coal-fired power station? No, we're not. That's a statement of fact. We are funding precisely what we promised. This is about making sure that when it comes to reliability and affordability of energy, to be able to support industry in areas of Queensland. Our government is willing to make sure that industry has the energy that it needs and is working through the process to make sure that investors have the information they need to make informed decisions to support those jobs in Queensland. And I'm surprised that a Queensland senator uh, would be raising such concerns about order, jobs senator in Birmingham. Queensland. Senator, order. I, I have order. I'll call you when there's silence, Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Investment, representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Increases. Uh, Reputex have reported order, today— um, Order. Senator Waters, uh, I'm going to insist that the correct titles of ministers are used. Please don't do that again. Senator Waters. So noted. Thank you, President. Um, Reputex have reported today that emissions from gas production are a mind-boggling 621 per cent above 2005 levels. Industrial emissions are also up 60 per cent, driven by the huge amounts of energy required to liquefy gas for LNG export. Gas is wiping out all of the gains of renewable energy. Why are you pretending gas is our saviour? The Minister representing the Minister for emissions, uh, Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator Waters for her question about uh, the role of gas exports in terms of Australia's emissions profile. Uh, it is correct, uh, as Senator Waters uh, indicates, that exports of, uh, of gas and liquefaction of uh, gas uh, for export uh, have contributed in that sector to an increase in Australia's emissions profile, while other areas that I note Senator Waters doesn't talk about uh, in terms of a reduction in our emissions across our own domestic energy consumption lead ultimately to a net reduction in Australia's emissions. But let's deal particularly with the question Senator Waters raises, which is about Australian export of gas to the rest of the world. Uh, now, Senator Cormann has outlined in answers recently about the role that Australian coal can play relative to coal from other countries uh, that is less efficient than Australian coal and that creates more emissions when it is burnt. Gas, of course, plays an even bigger role in terms of emissions reduction as a transition fuel in other countries. 
So the important role that the LNG sector plays is not just as a contributor to Australia's exports, but also as a fuel source for other nations, helping them to get the reliable energy and power that they need, but also often as a substitute fuel source as they transition in their economies, sometimes transitioning away from coal, sometimes transitioning away from nuclear energy due to other factors, which I know the Greens also oppose. Uh, but of course, you're coming in here now criticising Australian gas exports as contributing to Australia's emissions, but ignoring the fact that those same gas exports may well be reducing by a far greater sum the emissions profile of the countries that they're going to. Now, this is the whole failure of the argument put by some others in this place, Mr President. Emissions are a global challenge. Australia plays our role, but we also have to look at the global picture and in this case, where we can provide more efficient Order. sources of Senator energy to Birmingham. other countries, we ought time for the answers expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Um, yes, yeah, thanks, President. Uh, Minister, you're essentially saying that our gas is uh, being substituted for coal. Can you please tell me which countries are now burning gas instead of coal, and how much each country has substituted, and how many tonnes of emissions have been reduced? Or is it the case that, in fact, these countries are now burning gas as well as coal, and you're just spouting fossil fuel industry talking points? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, th 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 thanks, Mr. President. Um, I don't know whether Senator Waters uh, wants a policy that basically limits the energy consumption of other countries, but the truth is, many countries within our region have increasing energy needs. That is a subset of increasing populations, higher living standards, fewer people living in poverty, a whole range of factors that are driving the growth of living standards. And thank you, Senator McGrath. Yes, indeed. Fewer people living in poverty, more people enjoying higher living standards are a good thing. Increased energy consumption is part of that. Now, they could have chosen to use more domestic coal sources in order. some of those Senator cases. Senator Waters, on a point of order. Uh, thanks, President. Look, my question was a, a specific one about the substitution claim that you've made, asking you to provide evidence of that, and I, I haven't heard that being addressed yet. That, but that, it's obviously central to the government's argument, and they should Senator substantiate Waters, you've made your claims, point of even order. though they won't you've be. You've made your point of order. It's not a time for argument. Um, you did, at the conclusion, ask for specifics, but you made an assertion at the start as well. The minister is allowed to expound upon that assertion and be directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, the point I was making is that these countries have got growing energy needs. So, indeed, they may be pursuing, in many cases, gas as an alternative to where they might have instead used domestic coal reserves if they have them. Alternate coal reserves where they are able to access them, even Australian coal potentially. But they've chosen to Order, use Senator LNG. Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, President. The government has signalled that it will take a 2050 target to the UN meeting in Glasgow, but the UN's <laughs> climate scientists say that catastrophic tipping points will be reached if we don't halve pollution in the next decade. Will the government's pledge for a tiny 3.9 per cent reduction over 10 years be lifted so that our national aspirations are in line with the science? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, our commitment in terms of the 26 to 28 per cent reduction uh, by 2030 commitment uh, is, in terms of per capita terms, uh, one of the most significant commitments made in the world. In terms of by GDP terms, it's a significant reduction of Australia's emissions intensity, again, far greater uh, than commitments made by most other nations around the world. Uh, Australia goes forward determined to meet those targets and, as the Prime Minister and I and others have repeatedly said, to beat those commitments we've made for the 2030 horizon. Uh, our ambition ought to be to beat them uh, by as comfortable a margin, if not more, than the way in which we are already beating and forecast to beat our 2020 targets, which is a substantial excess that Australia has managed to achieve in relation to the 2020 targets and the ambitions we take forward by backing technology and technological change in Australia that can help to drive technological change overseas is about making sure we do Order. successfully Senator beat Birmingham. those targets. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government's plan to build a stronger economy is helping to ensure that young Australians are given the best opportunities to succeed? Order. 
Order the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you to Senator Chandler for her question, Mr. President. Uh, the coalition uh, strives to ensure maximum opportunity for younger Australians with the best available opportunities in education, yeah. employment, and uh, most appropriate assistance for those who require some help or are in a crisis. The government's focus is for young people to uh, support them in to be healthy, active and engaged participants in society and the economy. Mr President, as our first step, we've established a youth, develop, youth, fast, youth task force. Uh, and as Minister, one of the most uh, enlightening things uh, and most enjoyable things as part of my portfolio, Mr President, has been actually engaging with young people and the organisations that represent them. Um, organisations such as Youth Activating Youth, Mr. President, an organisation uh, based out of Victoria who is assisting disadvantaged, multicultural young Australians uh, to re engineer their lives and their commitments based in Victoria. Year 13, a socially driven organisation connecting young Australians with all of the options available after high school and beyond. And, Mr. President, today we welcome the winners of the Haywire regional youth pro uh, program that's being conducted by the ABC to the parliament. Uh, and one of the real pleasures has been to hear their ideas, their stories and how we can work with them to, um, to improve Australia and their, ac their activities. At the end of, Australia la uh, end of last year, Mr President, I announced that we would fund the 2020 Australian Youth Development Index. The Australian Youth Affairs Council will um, uh, undertake this work, and it is essential, Mr. President, to provide key information to inform the evidence on the status of youth development in Australia. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. And as the youngest woman in this place, I found the minister's response quite enlightening. Uh, can the minister? Order. Order. Can the minister? <laughs> Order. Stop the clock. <laughs> Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please update the Senate how the government is creating more jobs for young Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Again, Senator, thanks, Senator Chandler, for a question. Mr. President, the Australian government is focused on getting more young Australians off welfare and into work. Uh, we recognise that the best way to do that is to build a strong economy that enables employers to be more productive. Uh, more competitive, more innovative, uh, and to create more job opportunities. And as Senator Birmingham has just said, uh, the bringing into force of the Peru Free Trade Agreement overnight is just one of those initiatives. Mr. President, we have funded uh, the Youth Jobs Path Program, which Labor, which Labor fought tooth and nail. They, they opposed. And more than 88,500 young people, Mr. President, uh, have participated, with 56,000 of them getting a job. 56,000 of them getting a job. Uh, 500 million, 80 million dollars, Mr. President, through the Transitions to Work program to allow disadvantaged young people to help with them. Order, the Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what action has the government taken to address youth mental health? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, I think this is one of the. Uh, thank you, Senator Chandler. Uh, this is one of the signature initiatives of the coalition government: uh, $509 million youth mental health and su suicide prevention plan, um, the largest suicide prevention strategy in Australia's history. Uh, we we all talk about our aspiration to get suicide to zero, uh, and this government is actually investing in that. Uh, and we've done that off, also off the bat of the bushfire tragedy that's been occurring in uh, South East Australia recently. So we've put $8 million to extend Beyond Blue's BU mental health, uh, mental health in Education program for schools for those who are involved uh, in recovery of the bushfire. We put an extra $4.4 million to fast-track the establishment of a new headspace in Batemans Bay. Our government is ensuring Australians and their families get access to the best care and support when they need it. Senator Kitching. President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. 
Yesterday, the minister suggested footage contained in a Liberal Party advertisement had been obtained from, and I quote, a gallery of photos available on the website for people to download and use. The Department of Defence's website clearly states that materials provided can only be reproduced in an, and I quote, unaltered form. Why did the Liberal Party's advertisement contain footage in breach of the Department of Defence's policy? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I sincerely thank Senator Kitching for that question, uh, because for two reasons. One, it allows me to answer your question I took on notice yesterday, and also uh, add some more information in terms of your question today. Uh, an authorisation line, as you know, so coming to the question from yesterday, is required on material produced by a member or senator under Australian law. Any multimedia material created with reference to ADF assistance to the bushfire response was designed to inform the community about what the Commonwealth Government was doing. The purpose of the material was also to communicate as simply and as helpfully Order. as we possibly Senator, could. Senator, what? I'm taking, I'm taking a point of order. Senator Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, I don't know if we're in a time machine. This was yesterday's question. We'd actually like an answer to today's question. Completely different question. Um, I, 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 I'm, 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 will, I'm happy to rule on the point of order if there's silence. Order. I'm listening. Oh, sorry, Senator Cormann, I was about to rule. It, it, on, the, on the point of order, um, the senator actually directly referenced the question that was asked yesterday in his question today. So I would have thought that the way the minister is answering is absolutely directly relevant to the question as asked. Senator Wong, on the point of order. Mr. President. Oh, I'll take Senator Wong's point of order and then I'll rule. Mr President, if the minister wishes to add to an answer from yesterday because her answer was incomplete, there is the, the, order. the usual convention is to do so after question time. So, on the point of order, the question did reference yesterday's question. The minister is allowed to be directly relevant by referencing yesterday's question. However, there is a more appropriate time to explicitly add to answers in yesterday's question time, uh, which is at the usually at the conclusion of question time. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer, um, and I'll call upon her to continue. She has one and a half minutes remaining. Uh, well, further to uh, your question yesterday, as we've just discussed, and also directly relevant to this question today, uh, Defence was not tasked to provide any imagery or footage for the material. And there is a significant Order. amount of footage of ADF activity in the public domain. And uh, conveniently, conveniently, when I was uh, researching Order. this issue yesterday, I found uh, some social media from the Australian Labor Party authorised by uh, Mr Wright. And guess what? It shows ADF troops. So it asked me the order. question, well, where did you get this order. material Senator, from? Senator Reynolds, uh, Senator Wong on a point of order. I, I'm going to allow... Uh, wow. Order. That's, that's wow. the best you can do. I'm going to make you're one minister, You're a minister of the Crown. That's the best you order. can do. Order. Order. Order everywhere. Order. I'm, I don't spontaneously um, draw ministers to the standing orders, so I call upon a point of order rather than do it spontaneously. Assume. Yep. Um, on this question, it is relevant for the minister to talk about footage and the footage used in the advertisement referred to. I don't believe it is directly relevant um, to refer to um, uh, something of another party that may or may not have been at a very different time. There are opportunities to debate the merits of questions and answers after question time, and there are other opportunities to bring such matters to the attention of the Senate. Um, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Mr President, I've answered the question. Defence was not tasked to provide in any imagery or footage of order. For that material um, that you referenced. Senator, Senator Wong, on the point of order. Point Direct of order. relevance. The Senator Kitching's question went to the question of why the Liberal Party's footage what breached def the Defence Department's policy. Um, and that was, it was not a question about whether the Defence Department tasked the footage, no, I, which I'm, is the way the minister construed the question. I, I, I think, with respect, all right, I'll call let, let Senator Cormann rule. Well, I mean, uh, Minister Reynolds is able to answer questions in relation to her portfolio. Minister Reynolds is not in a position to answer questions on behalf of the Liberal Party. Um, order. Order. I, I, can I just rule on the? I'll, I'll just rule on the point of order. With respect, Senator Wong, I, that, that 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 last part of the question you did accurately reflect what Senator Kitching said. However, I do believe 
if the minister is ad directly addressing issues around the footage or its how it was obtained, I do with respect think that is uh, a matter that is directly relevant. I can't instruct her how to answer the question, and I remind senators that there is an opportunity to debate the merits of answers afterwards. Senator Reynolds. Just for total clarity, uh, Mr President, I did directly answer the question when I said Defence was not tasked to provide any imagery or footage of Order. the material. And there is a significant amount of footage of ADF activity in the public domain, which I pointed out that the Labor Party has also accessed over, over the years. So, I could Order. Not be clearer, Mr. President. Order. Senator Kitching. Oh. Senator Kitching's on her feet. Well, Senator firstly, Kitching, a supplementary question. Firstly, Mr. President, on a point of order, relevance to the question so I asked. The, 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 and Senator Kitching, sorry. Am I getting the, today's Senator, answer Senator, tomorrow? Senator Kitching, the is Senator Reynolds has happen? concluded her answer. It is not appropriate to raise a point of order <laughs> once a minister has concluded their answer about direct relevance. Senator the Kitching, department's website also clearly states material cannot be used, and I quote, without specific written authorisation from the Department of Defence. When and from whom was permission obtained by the Liberal Party? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Senator Kitching, uh, as Senator Cormann has pointed out, I am the Minister for Defence. And I answered the defence aspect order. of that question. Order. That we Senator were not Wong tasked, on the point of order. I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, Senator that Wong. Uh, uh, order. I've got right. Senator Wong on her feet. Senator Wong. Direct relevance. This, we are asking the Minister for Defence about the application of defence policy, that is, the written authorisation. Senator Cormann, on the point of order. On the point of order, uh, the minister was being directly uh, relevant to her portfolio responsibilities. She made very clear what the uh, re matters relevant to defence were. Uh, the minister is not in a position uh, to, uh, she does not represent the Liberal Party in this chamber. She represents the defence portfolio. On the point of order, two matters. Um, on the, on the point of order, two matters. Firstly, firstly, the minister had been speaking for eight seconds. Um, I find it hard to believe that, unless there is an egregious breach, I can call a minister with eight seconds to a point of direct relevance. So, so I need to allow the minister to complete a sentence or two. Um, with respect, the statement that immediately prior uh, to my memory the point of order was raised, the minister made an observation referencing an answer earlier, oh, a comment earlier by the leader of the government. I don't believe that is not that the, I believe that making that observation can still be directly relevant. The point of order goes to the merits of an answer, which is not in the capacity of the chair, um, nor is it in the capacity of the chair to direct a minister how to answer a question as long as they're directly relevant. So I'll call the minister to continue, noting she has 52 seconds remaining. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And just to be extremely clear, I will say it again. I am the Minister for Defence, and I'm answering the defence aspects of this. Yes, there is a policy on the website. Defence was not tasked to provide any imagery or footage of the material. There is a significant amount of footage in the public domain, which is regularly accessed by, by many. And I will also point out that the question yesterday related to social media of the Prime Minister, which the question would be best directed to the Prime Minister's representative. And you're talking about the Liberal Order. Party. Order. Uh, Senator, Senator, Senator Reynolds, please resume your seat. Senator, Senator Watt. Order. I'll call Senator Watt when I can hear him. Point of order. Senator Watt. Point, point of order. order. The question is about the application of a policy of the Department of Defence. The only person who can answer that question is the Minister for Defence. And, and, and Senator she Watt, should be able to answer this. Senator Watt, um, you make an observation that is not in the capacity of the chair to direct a minister how to answer a question, as long as the minister is being directly relevant. And I believe she was being directly relevant. Even if some people don't like the answer, there are opportunities to debate that, but it is not for me to judge. Senator Reynolds, have you concluded your answer? Uh, Mr President, I can repeat the answer as Minister for Defence again, but I think I've covered it adequately the last three or four times. Senator, Order. Senator Kitching is on her feet. <laughs> Lucky. Senator Kitching. Lucky we have estimates coming up. The department's website unamb unambiguously states, and I quote, this material cannot be used for political purposes or in a way contrary to Defence's apolitical standing. As Defence Minister, what action are you taking as a result of the breach of Department of Defence policy 
by the Liberal Party. Senator Reynolds. Well, I totally and utterly reject the statement, the premise of your uh, question there. You are saying that there has been a breach. I have seen no evidence of a breach. You have demonstrated no evidence of a breach. I have suggested. Order, Senator Watt. I have told you what the defence Sen policy. Order, Senator Reynolds. I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Um, Mi Mr. President, is, and the point of order relates to relevance. This whole series of questions is predicated on an answer the minister gave yesterday in which she said that this footage was obtained from Defence Department well, websites. So, right, Senator, Re Senator to which White, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm, That's the breach. That's not a, that's that, the with breach. respect, there's a point of order or you're attempting to make a point about the content of an answer. The minister was directly addressing an assertion contained in the question and is directly relevant if she is doing that. And in this case, the minister was entirely directly relevant, using in fact the same words contained in the question. Uh, as I remind senators, there's an opportunity to debate the merits of answers at other times. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you much, very much, Mr. President. And as I said at the beginning of the first question, is the question I took on notice yesterday was relevant, and I said that I took it on notice to get further information. I have provided further information as Minister for Defence. And it is very, very clear, as Minister for Defence, what the answer is. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister. Order. Order. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. What steps is the Morrison government taking to support Australian jobs and build a stronger economy by ensuring small business get paid on time. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Rennick for his question. And Mr President, uh, cash flow is king for small business in so many ways. In the Morrison government, uh, we are committed to backing our 3.4 million small and family businesses every step of the way. They employ almost 7 million Australians. And as we know, they are the lifeblood, they are the backbone of the local communities in which they are located. They also though, play a very important role as suppliers and service providers to big businesses. And in fact, the trade between SMEs and big businesses is worth more than $550 billion per year. We're all aware of the saying, cash flow is king. And if we accept that saying, that cash flow is indeed king, then late payments to small businesses are a potential usurper to every small business in Australia. Mr President, the damage that late payments can inflict on small businesses in Australia cannot be understated. And that is why the government has put in place policies and is leading by example when it comes to ensuring that small businesses are paid properly and are paid on time. You'll be aware that the government has introduced 20-day payment times for small businesses that have contracts with the government up to $1 million. And we believe that all governments uh, should put in place these policies. And I'm very pleased that the states have agreed uh, through the COAG process that cash flow is crucial to any small business and that all governments should lead the way in paying small businesses on time. We're also taking action to ensure that large businesses who want to do business with government, they will need to match our 20-day payment policy. Small and family businesses need to be paid Order, on time, Senator Cash. and we are time leading the by example. has expired. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Uh, what further actions is the government planning to take to support small business to get paid on time? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, we are introducing a new framework for reporting of large business payment times to small business suppliers. The government will shortly introduce legislation into the parliament that will require businesses with an annual turnover of over $100 million to publicly report how and when they pay their small business suppliers. This is all about improving payment outcomes for small businesses. We will release the exposure draft next week and then we will introduce the legislation at the end of March. The Payment Times reporting framework will create transparency and will enable small businesses and indeed the Australian public to know how and when they will be paid by big business. And, uh, Mr President, I do look forward to widespread support 
for these measures. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? Senator Cash. Unfortunately, Mr President, we are, because we know the policies that the Labor Gov uh, Party took to the election um, in relation to small business. And had those policies been implemented, uh, they would have quite literally decimated small and family business in Australia. On this side of the chamber, though, we are committed to putting in place policies that will see our small and family businesses prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. Uh, and in particular, providing them with much-needed tax relief, something the Labor Party themselves don't believe in. We on this side of the chamber understand uh, that the more money the small business has in their own back pocket, the more they are enabled to invest back into their own business, improving their access to finance, supporting small businesses with tax dis uh, disputes, increasing their digital capability, but also an incredibly important measure, investing in the mental health of small business owners. They are the backbone of the Australian economy. Order, and we on Senator this side Cash, of the time for the answer has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Tourism, Senator Birmingham. Tourism, of course, brings millions of dollars into the Australian economy each year, with over 9.3 million tourists visiting um, each year alone, bringing an investment of $12.3 billion. Yet, because of these extreme fires, tourists have been leaving many of our favourite spots in droves, while businesses have had to lay off staff, businesses have had loss of uh, income, and of course, communities continue to suffer. Isn't it true that the only assistance that your government has offered to these businesses in bushfire-affected regions who are suffering because of this huge downturn in tourism is a concessional loan which puts business into more debt or recovery grants which are only available to those who have been directly affected? Minister, does it take a burnt shop front before your government will step in and help? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Hanson Young for her question, and, uh, uh, and indeed the government shares her concern for uh, many businesses across Australia who are doing it tough at present in the tourism sector, not just because of the bushfire impact. If uh, Senator Hanson Young consulted out across the tourism industry right around Australia, she would find there are tourism businesses well outside of bushfire-affected areas who faced consequences from the bushfires as a result of much of the misinformation and lies that were spreading on the internet or reported internationally about where the fire impacts were had. Equally, uh, the coronavirus has had an impact and is having an impact now, not just on travel in Australia, but on global travel. And so we have a circumstance where tourism businesses right around the country uh, are doing it tough. Those who are internationally facing and, uh, and re rely more upon global tourism markets are feeling particular pressures. Those, of course, directly in fire-affected regions, such as Kangaroo Island in our home state, Senator Hanson Young, uh, of course, uh, those in, uh, in New South Wales and Victoria, particularly those coastal communities, some of which I've visited, uh, who rely upon the sort of six-week period or so over Christmas for the bulk of their cash flow. Now, the government has, uh, has uh, provided for up to $500,000 in concessional loans, which you referenced uh, in part, Senator Hanson-Young. Those concessional loans uh, can assist businesses uh, in a range of different ways in terms of how they structure themselves, including uh, accessing capital during these tough times. Those concessional loans uh, come at zero interest for the first two years. Uh, are then uh, apply at half of the concession or half of the bond rate uh, thereafter. So these are highly concessional loans to help businesses who may not have the type of insurance products that some others do have uh, to be able to see themselves through these tough times. Uh, but importantly, they also complement the efforts we're making to try uh, to lift Order, tourism Senator again. Time not with the answer has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my supplementary question hopefully can get a bit more of a direct answer from the minister. Will the government reconsider the consequence of pushing small business in fire affected communities into more debt, review the eligibility of the recovery grants, and put more money on the table this year? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, th thanks, Mr. President. The government has announced a $76 million package of support for the tourism industry, uh, which is uh, the largest single injection uh, into the tourism industry, on top of a record budget for Tourism Australia. 
I acknowledge the work of state and territory governments uh, of all political persuasions who uh, are pursuing uh, additional, um, additional uh, policies and programs and campaigns in terms of promoting uh, their tourism industries. The government has been very clear all along that in terms of the $2 billion that we have committed to support bushfire recovery, that is an initial investment of $2 billion, and we will look at other ways in which we can provide for recovery and other support across communities. But I would caution Senator Hanson Young and the Greens in terms of thinking that cash payments need be the ultimate answer to everything. Uh, in addition to the loans we spoke of before, the government's made decisions for those businesses in fire-affected regions about the lodgement of business activity statements, in term, which will provide Order, for Senator deferred Birmingham, payment time around the tax matters. Has expired. Senator Hanson Young, final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Um, does the government believe? Who does the government believe deserves more taxpayer support? Fire-ravaged communities small businesses or your mates in the coal industry with an indemnity payment for a new coal-fired power plant? Senator Birmingham. Stop shouting. Well, thanks, um, thanks, thanks, Mr President. I'm happy to be able to bring together at least a couple of questions I've faced. Uh, I've already addressed in this chamber the $10 million uh, for, um, for feasibility and business case studies into, uh, into yes. Uh, a coal-fired generation facility, potentially uh, uh, a high-efficiency one in Queensland, and, uh, I'd note, a pumped hydro facility that is also being funded out of that same $10 million. It does stand somewhat in contrast, though, Mr President, to the $2 billion, $2 billion, with a B, Senator Hanson Young, that we have committed towards the fire-affected communities and their recovery and support for them. So, Mr. President, I think it is very clear that this government's work in terms of supporting those fire affected communities, whether it's the deployment of defence forces, the financial support and programs being supplied, not just in areas of tourism, but of course in mental health, in wildlife recovery, a range of areas, is firmly delivering all they need. And we've been Order, very clear Senator that there Birmingham, is more. Time there will for be the more. answer has expired. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister currently representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Sky News has reported that I Liberal order. MPs. Order. Order. Senator Green. Sky News has reported that Liberal MPs were concerned they wouldn't get all the money they wanted from government's corrupt sports rorts program, and the federal Liberal Party director assured them he would get onto it. What role did the federal Liberal Party play in the awarding of grants under the corrupt sports rorts program? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Green for that uh, question. Um, let me just uh, completely reject the premise of the question. The Sports Grants Program is a very popular, highly successful program where there was uh, more demand than available, than available resources. And of course, what Minister McKenzie uh, did uh, in you know, reviewing the recommendations that were made by Sports Australia, uh, she made sure that electorates represented by Labor members uh, received a fairer share of the grants that, that were available. And if, uh, if Minister McKenzie had not uh, deployed her discretion and made judgments, uh, the, uh, the, the allocation of funding would have been more inappropriate. More inappropriate. So, um, you know, I mean, I think, I think that that is a matter of public record. I've said that uh, on, on a number of occasions. Now, I have not personally been involved. I've not personally been involved in the decisions in relation to uh, those uh, projects. I mean, that obviously, appropriately, was a matter for the Minister for Sports. Uh, but uh, so, I mean, that is that is really all there is to it. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you. One government MP said in relation to the Prime Minister's office and the sports grants program, and I quote, quite obviously his office and the party directors like Hursty would have been across trying to work out who gets what. Why was Mr Hertz involved? Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'm not aware that Mr. Hurst uh, was involved. I mean, I'm not uh, in the habit of commenting on anonymous uh, quotes, uh, if indeed it is an accurate quote. Uh, furthermore, what I would say is the Prime Minister has been very clear on the public record uh, in relation to uh, the, his involvement and the involvement of his office, and I've also uh, made uh, you know, clear statements in relation to these matters, and I refer you to those previous statements. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. 
Which member of the Prime Minister's office discussed the awarding of grants under the Community Sports Infrastructure Program with the Federal Director of the Liberal Party? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. I don't accept the premise of the question. The Prime Minister has been very clear on uh, the involvement that his office uh, has had uh, in relation to these matters, and that was one of advocacy uh, on behalf of members that approached— Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance. The question is which member of the staff? Um, with respect, the minister was being directly relevant to the answer. He's allowed to challenge an assumption or an assertion in the question. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the uh, involvement of the Prime Minister's Office has been well documented uh, in the Prime Minister's Office, consistent with the uh, Prime Minister's Office's in time immemorial uh, made representations on behalf of uh, uh, members of Parliament, uh, and, and that, is, that is entirely appropriate. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate how the Morrison government is continuing to strengthen the Australian defence industry? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Scar, for that question. And also, I'd like to acknowledge your engagement and support for Queensland industry. Thank you. Australia's burgeoning defence industry is essential to ADF operations and also it's critical to generating the capability we need here to protect Australia and our nation's interests. And because of the Morrison government's strong economy, we are able to invest a record $200 billion in completely transforming the ADF and also to take our defence expenditure up to 2 per cent of GDP something that uh, those opposites completely failed to do. But not only, not only are we completely re-equipping the ADF, we are also the first government to fully engage and support Australian industrial capability through programs such as the $90 billion Naval Shipbuilding Plan, $20 billion to modernise the Australian Army's fighting vehicles and $18 billion to deliver the next generation of strike and air combat aircrafts systems. This is not only just an opportunity for primes, but also for small to medium Australian businesses, which are the engine room of the Australian economy. In fact, in the last financial year alone, over $8 billion of defence contracts were awarded to Australian SMEs, which equates to thousands and thousands of new high-tech jobs right here in Australia. A great example of this growth is that since the inclusion of the local industry capability plans in major construction contracts, now 80 per cent of all subcontracts are going to local companies right across this nation, which directly benefits local businesses and injects over $3 billion into local economies right across our nation. In addition, the government is investing about $1.5 billion across the Next Generation Technologies Fund and also the Defence Innovation Hub. We are supporting defence industry and we're backing Order, them Senator in. Senator Reynolds, and we're time for the answer has expired. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate how Army's vehicle programs will create jobs for Australians and support Australian defence industry, particularly, particularly in my home state of Queensland? Senator Reynolds. Thanks, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar again for that question. This government is investing over $20 billion in modernising Army's fighting vehicles and a further $5 billion in Land 121 for logistics vehicles, which are now ready to commence exercises and training. But under the $5 billion Boxer Combat Reconnaissance Program, 211 vehicles will be delivered, creating an estimated 1,450 jobs across the country and, in particular, nearly 350 jobs in Queensland. Over the 30-year life of the boxer, Australian industry is expected to secure $10.2 billion of work to build and also to maintain the fleet. That, again, is thousands of jobs throughout the supply chain over that time. The majority of these vehicles will be built in Australia by Australians using Australian steel at Queensland's Rheinmetall Australian facility in Red Bank. Local businesses, including frontline manufacturing, uh, and rock press for mine blast protects Order. Plates, Senator uh, Reynolds, time the for the answers expired. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the min Order. Senator Scar. Can the minister outline to the Senate how our air combat, combat programs will create jobs for Australians and also support our Australian defence industry, particularly in my home state of Queensland? Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And as I said, this government has an incredibly proud record of delivering defence capability by Australians for Australians using Australian equipment and metal. The next generation of the Air Force strike and air combat capabilities is part of our record investment in the ADF. For the Joint Strike Fighter Global Supply Chain Program, over 50 Australian companies have already shared in $1.7 billion worth of contracts under this acquisition, and we are on track to deliver more than 5,000 Australian jobs for this project alone. Queensland-based companies, Ferro Engineering in Brisbane, TAE Aerospace at Amberley and Heat Treatment Australia in Brisbane have been successful in winning JSF work, not only for the ones that we are acquiring, but for the global supply chain for the J Joint Strike Fighter. And in addition, more than 90 per cent of Boeing Australia's new $280 million contract to sustain and upgrade our Super Hornets and Growlers will be delivered by Australian Order. industry. Order. Senator so Reynolds, 230... time for the answer has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Reynolds and Cormann to the questions asked by Senator Green and me. I was going to start in another way, acting, uh, Madam Deputy President, but I'm just going to actually take the chamber through what has happened with the defence imagery which Senator Reynolds seems incapable of knowing. She apparently, Senator Watt, I'll take that interjection, she is the Minister for Defence, but I'm going to take her through what's happened with the um, Defence Image Gallery. I'm happy to uh, give Senator Reynolds all of the web addresses uh, so that she can check these for herself. But on the, on the issue of defence imagery, Senator Reynolds referred to the Defence Image Gallery yesterday. There is also a defence video library which is currently being revamped um, and that's being hosted on YouTube in the interim while the revamp is occurring. Without, I don't want to spend hours uh, going through all of the video, but it's clear that the footage from Defence's YouTube channel was used in the Prime Minister's Twitter video. Here are a few examples. At about 002 through to 004, in the Prime Minister's video, there is footage of defence personnel clearing trees. That footage is from a defence video. And again, Madam Deputy President, I have the web address for that. At about 005 through 009 in the Prime Minister's video, there is footage of the MV Sycamore. That footage is also from a defence video. At about 010 to 014 in the Prime Minister's video, there is footage of personnel in helicopters. That footage is, in part, from a defence video. So it's the one of the ADF member giving the thumbs up. I want to go to the copyright section of Defence's website, and again I have the web address for the Minister if she would like to check. I don't plan to read all of it. It's quite long and le it's quite lengthy. It starts with the copyright symbol, Commonwealth of Australia 2020. I'm only going to read parts of it. This material cannot be used for political purposes or in a way contrary to Defence's apolitical standing. To obtain a commercial, reproduce and share video and imagery licence, please contact Defence Digital Media. Provide links to the specific video and imagery and a detailed explanation of the intended use of the product. So if the minister is incapable of answering these questions, I've got another solution for her. If you go to the Financial Report 2018-2019 and also go to the ANAO's recent report into the Defence's media and communications activity, again, I'm sure that the minister will be able to find these, but if she can't, I will be able to give her those references. And I'm going to give her the table numbers so that they are very clear and very easy to find. There are 129.6 employees in the Defence communications and media team. So let's round that up to 130 people in there. Um, 
did Minister Reynolds not go to visit any of those people, or did she not? Did someone in her office did not phone up and ask? Well, hey, I got asked these questions about a video. There's 130 people in that team. Surely one of them could have answered a question. But wait, there's more. So I'm, that's referring to Table 1.3 for the minister's benefit in the ANAO report. But if you go to the financial year report of 1819, you'll see that that department costs the Australian taxpayer $21 million. So surely the minister or the department is able to answer the questions I asked yesterday. Now, this is the Ministerial and Executive Coordination and Communication Division. I just want to be very clear so that people are able to follow this, including the minister and the department. Um, but of course, you know, we've seen that this government, this, she is not a lone ranger in this, in this government uh, as a defence minister impinging upon the impartiality of the ADF. Because remember, last March, before the federal election, we had uh, then Minister Pine, uh, who was the, the predecessor of um, Minister Reynolds, and Min then Minister Pine was doing a press conference with senior military personnel, and uh, he was asked some questions about uh, whether he was going, what preference deals the government was going to enter into in the election, and uh, the, the chief of the defence force stood, went up to him and said, "Look, it's not appropriate for us to be in this uh, in this media conference, you know, appearing uh, like some uh, coalition members do of sort of nodding in the background." Thank you, Senator that is not your time the role of the defence force. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I want to take the opportunity at the outset in taking note of answers today to place on the record my genuine and sincere disappointment at the choice opposition senators have made about the questions that they focused on today and about the ones they have chosen to take note of following question time today. Uh, and I say this and I preface this by saying, Senator Kitching, this is not intended to damage your political career or mine, uh, but I do have some respect and admiration for you, and there are occasionally areas where we do have agreement. But instead of choosing to focus today on the very fair and reasonable questions and very important questions that Senator Dodson asked about closing the gap, instead of to choosing to focus on the other big policy issues we've been debating in this chamber and in this building this week, on emissions reduction or energy prices, uh, instead of choosing to ask questions about the very serious and real uh, challenges that our regional communities are facing in recovering from bushfires, uh, from drought and now in some areas uh, even from flood, uh, the opposition has chosen instead to focus their take note and one of their questions today on a social media video posted during January by the Liberal Party of Australia. This very sadly, in my view, sums up the priorities of the opposition. What they could have instead chosen to talk about or reflect upon were what I thought were two excellent speeches in the House of Representatives today by both the Prime Minister and the opposition leader on closing the gap. Uh, I thought they set out very clearly and very articulately the different approaches that the government and the opposition take on these matters, but also some important areas of agreement. Uh, for example, uh, I thought uh, that the Prime Minister's there were three positive things about the Prime Minister's speech today. Uh, on the one hand, uh, he was very direct and very honest about the areas in which we have made progress and about the areas where we unfortunately have not made progress towards the closing the gap. Uh, goals. I thought uh, it was good, though, that uh, it remained largely positive and optimistic throughout, because particularly in the space of Indigenous affairs, we cannot allow ourselves to become despondent and negative all the time. We should be sober and realistic about the challenges that we have, but we should celebrate the progress that we have made. And it was also deeply philosophical. It talked about a thoroughly liberal approach to assisting Indigenous Australians to empower themselves to help improve their own situation. And I thought the Prime Minister framed those issues very well. Equally, although I didn't catch all of the opposition leaders' speech, the parts that I heard, I thought very clearly set out their commitment uh, to constitutional change as a pathway that they thought uh, was the best way of fixing uh, the problems that we all accept uh, and all are concerned that Indigenous communities face. 
Uh, instead, uh, we have heard a five-minute speech from Senator Kitching and a question today uh, about whether or not a video that was posted on social media, not an advertisement that has sometimes inaccurately been characterised as, uh, featured some freely available, publicly available footage uh, or not from the Defence Department. Uh, I represent the state of Victoria, as does Senator Kitching. Uh, the community of Gippsland uh, in far eastern Victoria has been particularly badly hit. I think they will be harshly judgmental to think that their senators who represent them in this place are having an argument in this place uh, about a social media video and its authorisation and not the homes that they lost, the lives that they lost, the lessons that we need to learn from this bushfire season to make sure that it doesn't happen again, or if it does happen again, that we're better placed to respond to it and manage it. I think that's the focus that they would want us to have. I'm pleased to serve as the Deputy Chair of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Uh, it has been referred by this chamber an inquiry into the bushfires. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working in a bipartisan way with Labor senators and, and the new uh, chair of the References Committee, uh, Senator Ayres uh, from New South Wales, to get around to affected communities, to hear their stories, to understand uh, their experience and to make tangible and useful recommendations to government ahead of the next fire season about how they can respond. I really, really, really hope that that committee is not at all or in any way detained by silly partisan Canberra inside the bubble arguments about social media videos and authorisations. I hope it is wholly and solely focused on substantive matters and things our constituents actually send us here to do. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Polly. Thank you very much. Deputy President, well, what an extraordinary contribution from Senator Patterson to come in here and try and lecture us about how we should behave when the nation is in a fire crisis. It is the government who has politicised the defence force in this country, and to have the minister in question time today not being able to answer the questions, trying to twist the words. You're trying to do the same thing, that it's all about authorisation. Well, the reality is the Australian people know how you, the government, have tried to politicise the Defence Force. You're, you're getting a reputation for it because you come in here and try and say, we should be talking about closing the gap. Well, we will be doing that this afternoon. But it's your government that has been in power for the last seven years. So to try and even lecture us about closing the gap and what should we be focusing on is it just a little bit rich. But to use the Australian crisis that we uh, as Australians face with the fire crisis and to politicise it by the Liberal Party <laughs> wanting to make sure that they could raise money off the bushfire tragedy, that is low. That is really low, even for this government. So the bar is not very high at all. But we know that, as people refer to the Prime Minister as Scotty for marketing, that you have come in here trying to spin it. We saw a pathetic, a pathetic attempt by the Minister for Defence to do the same thing. Just own it. Own it that you have politicised the Defence Force, you've tried to politicise and gain some traction and financial uh, gains out of the tragedy that has beset so many Australians right across this country. And it's not just what's happened in Victoria, it's in my home state as well of Tasmania. But what we have seen is a Prime Minister who is shonky. He is absolutely shonky. He will say and do anything. What we have seen is this is from this is not just what we are saying. This is in fact coming from people within your own party. They are they're asking questions when we want to turn to the, the shonky sports rot under Minister Mackenzie, when we have, and the question referred to that to, today, and I quote one of your colleagues, one of your parliamentary colleagues, quite obviously he is referring to the Prime Minister's office and the party um, directors like her. Resume your seat, please, Senator Polly. Senator Henderson. Oh, thank you very much, um, Deputy President. I would just ask the Senator to um, make her remarks through the chair. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Henderson. I, I, I'll listen carefully. I did think she was, but uh, Senator Polly, please to continue. Was some people may call the Prime Minister Scotty from marketing. I didn't say that. I'm quoting other people. But quite frankly, when your own colleagues from within the government are asking the questions about what role and um, identifying the fact that obviously the Prime Minister and the Director of the Liberal Party were actively involved in communicating with Senator McKenzie, that just reinforces the concerns that the Australian people have about this government, that the Prime Minister is all spin. He is all spin. There is no substance there at all. And he will do and say whatever it takes to get elected. That's what the Australian people are seeing from this Prime Minister, that he can't be trusted. I mean, of all the areas um, that are held with the highest respect in this country, it's our defence force. It's the Australian Defence Force, highly respected from both sides of parliament. But to use them in a political way, which is becoming the norm of this government, is unacceptable. And Australians will find that very offensive. And for somebody who has uh, had a daughter in the Defence Force, have two nephews, uh, one is still currently serving in the Royal Australian Navy, find that quite offensive that this government would stoop to politicising our defence force, because it undermines the value and the respect that we have in this country and have had for centuries. So what I think the Australian people want from this government is some leadership, some transparency, not to use institutions like the Defence Force for their own political gain, because that will be short-lived because the Australian people will respond in a way that I'm sure that you won't like at the next election. So a word of advice is stop trying to cover up for Thank Senator Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Um, yes, sorry. I'm just, your name's escaped me. I'm very sorry. McMahon. McMahon. I beg your pardon, Senator McMahon. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, Madam Deputy President, I, I have utmost um, respect for Senator Kitching and, and Senator Polly. They are, they are fine people, they are fine senators. I enjoy conversation with them. But um, obviously this side has, has set you up to absolutely fail today and has set you up to make a mockery of this system. To give you two seconds of video Two seconds of video, and that is the most important thing that you can talk about today. It's absolutely disgraceful, and I, uh, I echo the sentiments of um, my colleague Senator Patterson. That you know, we've had some really, really important topics brought up today. We've had some important questions. We've addressed um, issues of, of national importance, and the very best thing that Labor can come up with is two seconds of video. Two seconds. It's absolutely disgraceful and shameful. Um, have you got nothing else to think about? Have you got nothing else you can discuss? Is there nothing more important to you today than two seconds of video? Uh, Madam Deputy President, an authorisation line is required on any material produced by a member or senator under Australian law. The two seconds of video that they refer to included the following information, authorised by S. Morrison, Liberal Party, Canberra. Uh, I'm sorry, Senators, from the other side. The Prime Minister of Australia, not Scotty from Marketing. Show a little bit of respect. Any multimedia material created with reference to ADF assistance to the bushfire response was designed to inform the community about what the Commonwealth Government was doing. Many members of the community were concerned about what the ADF was or was not doing, what they should or should not be doing. This created concern and confusion in the community. It was absolutely the correct thing to do for the government to inform the community of how the ADF was being used, what they were contributing, and what they were doing. 
was simply to be as helpful as we could possibly be in a state of panic, fear, confusion and anxiety, with people wanting to know how and what the ADF was contributing. We needed to show people what resources we were getting and the support and how that was being used. Yet you take that reassurance from the government to people in affected areas, you take that, you pick two seconds out of it, and, uh, and that, that is your contribution to allying fears of people in bushfire affected areas. I have the greatest respect for the ADF and what they do. Uh, they do many fine things in my territory, the Northern Territory. We have a large military presence. I have large numbers of constituents in the ADF um, in the Northern Territory, uh, and I'm quite close friends with many of them. They're very proud of what they do. They're proud of what the ADF does. And they're very proud of what their fellow members of the ADF did during the height of the bushfire crisis. Their, their concern is what contribution they and their fellow members can make, and their concern is for their fellow members that are affected by the bushfires. Not one of them has contacted me and said that they are concerned about two seconds of video. Not one of them. Um, Madam Deputy President, again, I, I am horrified that all of this good work done by the ADF, their families, the sacrifices that they have made, and the pride with which they have conducted themselves throughout this crisis is being absolutely belittled by those on the other side of the chamber. Have, have some respect for what our defence forces do. Back them up, and if you can't show them support, at least don't try and criticise and tear down what they and Thank the government you, are doing. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of the answer that we received in response to my question to um, Senator Cormann. Um, and this question related to the corrupt sports rorts scandal. Um, but I just want to take note um, of some responses that we've received here after question time today, because if the government don't think that this matters, they have another thing coming because it matters to the community, it matters to the communities that I speak to, the communities that missed out on this funding, the volunteers, the mums and dads who took the time to write grant applica applications, who are today still trying to figure out how they're going to find shortfall in funding for female change rooms because their grant application was overlooked even though they scored 76 out of 100, which would have been over the threshold needed to get a grant. So it does matter to the community. It does matter to those mums and dads and those volunteers whether you use a merit-based system grant fund to prop up your own election campaign. And if the government, if the government would like the opposition to stop asking questions about the sports grants, the, the corrupt sports rot scheme, then they're very welcome to table the documents in the Senate that the Senate has required them to do so. They, they are very welcome to come in here and provide that information so we can get the information that we need to find out what happened to those grant applications. But I know that that order of production of documents will be spoken about shortly, so I would like to talk again about the order, Auditor General's report and the process by which the minister's office used a colour-coded spreadsheet to um, decide who to give these um, uh, grants to. Because the Auditor General's report is very clear. The Auditor General's report said the spreadsheet provided to the minister's office by Sports Australia included an assessment of scores that could have been used to rank the competing applications. But that was not done. 
Rather, it was initially proposed by the minister's office that applications located in a marginal or targeted electorate be successful at a significantly higher rate than the remaining applications. That's what the Auditor General found. The applications that the minister's office was proposing be successful were not those assessed as having demonstrated the greatest merit in terms of the published program guidelines. This was particularly the case for projects located in marginal and target electorates. And I just want to include that because we've had a series of different reports created. We've had um, uh, the minister um, uh, resign. So um, I think the government thinks that everybody's moved on from this Auditor General report. The Auditor General report is very clear. It is very clear what happened here. The question that remains after the Auditor General's report was who else was involved in this parallel process. We may have some clues as to who was involved. We know that uh, um, the member for Longman, Terry Young, who was at the time the LNP candidate for Longman, uh, praised Mr Hertz um, and the Prime Minister for visiting a kabulcha sports club on the eve of the election where he announced a half a million dollar grant to that sports club. Um, impeccable timing there on the eve of the election. Um, obviously, Minister Mackenzie um, at the time was busy and wasn't able to come and present that cheque. Um, so the Prime Minister went himself. He went himself. And we know um, that the Prime Minister's office was involved because an email from the Minister's office to Sports Australia asked for a slight adjustment to be made to the grants that were proceeding. And when it came to Sports Rots 2, even um, the current uh, Senator Henderson, who was at the time the Liberal MP for a marginal seat, said if, if it was not for the Prime Minister including this money in the budget, it would not have happened. So very proud at the time to stand there and take the credit. Very proud now to come out here and say that um, actually um, Minister Mackenzie did well. The current, uh, former Minister Mackenzie did the right thing in granting those applications, but um, not so proud to table the documents and to provide Australia with the information that they need, or to even answer the questions that we're putting to them. Thank in you, question Senator time. Green. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Kitching to take note be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers uh, given by the uh, Minister for Trade, representing the Minister for Energy in the House. To my question about why the obsession with gas, when the greenhouse gas figures actually show that gas is driving an increase in our emissions. In fact, emissions from the gas sector have gone up 600 plus per cent since 2005. Um, and, I, and I put that to the minister. Why is it that they're proposing that gas is somehow some solution to the climate crisis, gas being yet another fossil fuel, um, not to mention the impacts on land and on water from fracking for unconventional gas, which farmers are up in arms about and which the National Party seems to have forgotten to, to actually be on the side of farmers for? Um, I mentioned why this fascination with gas. Um, is it just because they're trying to throw former Minister Canavan under the bus because he's now spruiking even more for coal? We've seen the minister, the new resources minister, Mr Canavan's replacement, on the nuclear bandwagon. These guys are a complete rabble. Um, we all know the answer is renewables, but this government keeps saying that actually gas is the way to go. So where is the evidence when, in fact, the proof shows that gas is increasing our emissions? Well. The, the minister representing went to that tired old argument of, well, you know, countries might substitute coal. They might substitute coal for gas, and it's all going to be okay. So I asked him, well, which of these countries? How, how much coal is being replaced by gas? Where is your actual evidence for this contention? And you know, the minister did his level best, but he couldn't answer the question because it's not happening. In fact, countries are now using gas and coal. There's no substitution effect happening. It's just fossil fuel talking points that are being parroted by this government. And is it any wonder? Because you look at the donations figures that were just disclosed, and boy, is big gas a big contributor to this government. So maybe that's why they're supporting gas as somehow the new solution, um, along with coal and it seems also nuclear. Um, 
They're squabbling amongst themselves yet again over energy policy, and meanwhile the country has first cooked and is now flooded. When is this government going to get its act together and develop a climate policy based on science that can create jobs, look after workers and fix the climate crisis? They've got a renewable energy target that runs out this year. It's flat for the next 10 years. They've got ARENA, a fantastic body, the Renewable Energy Agency, which they frequently commend, that's due to run out of money. This government just has never met um, anything other than hypocrisy. Uh, and so, of course, I asked them about the 2050 target. They've made some positive noises. Even the Business Council now wants a zero emissions uh, target for 2050, and the government's kind of putting their toe in the water. They haven't committed to it yet, but maybe they're thinking about it. What's really clear, and what the scientists have said, is that if we don't make swift reductions in this next decade, on the pathway to a 2050 date, if we don't do the heavy lifting in this next 10 years, we will reach those catastrophic climate tipping points. Now we're already seeing the impact of a one degree rise, and this government's pathetic policies, if you can even call them that, has us on track for more than three degrees rise in global temperatures. That means more than three times the severity of the impacts that we're seeing. Um, but instead, they're wedded to the, to the coal industry, they're wedded to the gas industry, um, and they're continuing to dance to the tune of their donors. Now, they'll of course say that uh, they're going to meet and beat their targets. We've all heard that phrase. It's meet and beat their targets, and it's don't accept the premise of their question. We're, it's all on autopilot these days. We can sadly predict what they're going to say. But the carryover credits that they're claiming from the Kyoto uh, uh, Agreement period are most of that so-called reduction. And it was so beautifully put on Q&A the other night. It's like telling your, first wife, uh, your second wife that you did all your dishes in your first marriage. You don't have to do any dishes in this marriage. It was a fantastic analogy about relying on something that actually the rest of the world has said they're going to forego using those carryover credits. So no one buys the lies and the spin. They don't buy the dodgy accounting. They can see that Australia is at the back of the pack. And I want to just challenge one further contention that we frequently hear. They say we've got the biggest per capita cut under their pathetic targets. That's actually true. But you know what the sad bit is? Even if we did do that cut, we would still be the largest per capita greenhouse gas emitters in the world. That's how far behind the pack this nation is. It's about time fossil fuels got their hands off this government and we've got a decent climate policy that can look after workers and protect us all going forward. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Petition.